Well, as you can tell from the video, Falls Creek was a phenomenal week, a great week at the creek. I want to personally thank you. Several of you grabbed me this morning and said, hey, can you show me who this student is? Because you had that student's name on the wristband and we're praying specifically for that student. Thank you for praying. Uh, as a result, we had over 90 students and several adults uh, make the trip to Falls Creek. Uh, we had seven students surrender their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, amen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we had six students uh, recommit their lives to the Lord Jesus. As you saw in the video, we had six follow through uh, in believers' baptism. And on uh, Thursday night, uh, the, the night I was able to make it to Tabernacle with the students, uh, the executive director of the Oklahoma Baptist uh, convention and uh, actually preached all week long uh, in their tabernacle meetings in the evenings. And he spoke a, a message really challenging us uh, to service, a life of service. Whether it be vocational or just as a member of the body of Christ, God's called us all to serve in some capacity. But as he wrapped up his time, uh, he said, you know, it was uh, in places like Falls Creek where many of us were called to vocational ministry. And he put a challenge out there, if the Lord's stirring in your heart, even at a young age, uh, that God might be calling you to give your life away into full-time vocational ministry. And we had three students uh, that went forward that night confessing that they really felt a tugging in their heart that God was preparing them uh, for a life of vocational ministry. Uh, so Jordan and his team and I will be uh, working with those students to ensure that uh, they spend the rest of their high school years and, Lord willing, their college days preparing for that life of ministry and it not just be some uh, emotional feeling they had at a camp and they do nothing with it uh, from the days forward. So be praying for those three uh, as well as the seven that surrendered to Christ, those that rededicated their life, as well as other students that are walking with Jesus that were just challenged to grow in their journey with Jesus to take whatever their next step looks like uh, in their growth journey. So please be praying for them. Uh, we're going to dive into Judges chapter 7 this week. I'm going to go ahead and give you your homework before we dive into it. So homework is read chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, we're going to cover about two chapters today, 7 and 8. Uh, but next week we're going to cover four and it's going to kind of be a, an overview of those four chapters and specifically pull something from each of the uh, four judges that take place during those chapters. But before we dive into chapter 7, uh, a little more exhaustively and a glimpse at chapter 8, let's go to the Lord uh, in a word of prayer. Father, thank you uh, for what you did Last week at the creek in the lives of students and adults, Lord, I know I was challenged in my own journey with Jesus sitting in the tabernacle and uh, being a part of the, the, the morning devotional and uh, even our late night time together. Uh, what a great work you did even in my own heart. Uh, so I pray for uh, those who made some type of a decision and for those of us that have been walking with you for a good season uh, Lord, that you would continue to strengthen us uh, in our journey with you. And may the work that was done there overflow even to the work that you're doing here. And may the work that you're doing here overflow uh, into the areas of influence uh, that we will all be a part of this next week. Uh, so that you might receive the glory, honor, and praise uh, that we sang about this morning uh, from all of our lives. God, as we dive into your word, teach us today um, the positive things that we see in Gideon's life, uh, that we might repeat those even in ours. Uh, so speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So today, as we look specifically into chapter 7, wrap up with chapter 8, we're going to see at least two truths, uh, two things that were true uh, in Gideon's life. That if we really look at our life in light of how God sees us and through his word, these two truths would be applicable to our lives as well. So I'm going to state them as if we would own them ourselves. But we see these about Gideon's life. The first truth we're going to see is that God's power is perfected in our weakness. 
God's power is perfected in our weakness. This is something that we see in Gideon's life, that if we would evaluate ours in light of the word, we would certainly see this about our life as well. Verses 1 through 8 in chapter 7, we see this playing out in Gideon's life and then the life of God's people in Gideon's day. Starting in verse 1, here's how it reads. Early in the morning, Jerubel, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. Let me pause there just for a moment. If you remember in chapter 6, it ended with Gideon blowing the horn to rally the people of God. And the people of God rallied, and here we see them camping out and the battle getting ready to undergo. Verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. So Paul's there for a second. At the moment, there are 32,000 of God's people that have rallied together to wage war against their enemies. But look at verse 2 again. I underline this one in my Bible so that I would not forget it and take any credit of the work that God might do in and through my own journey. He said, you have too many men. Now, I'll fast forward a minute. If you look at chapter 8, verse 10, you'll see that the Midianites and those that gathered against Israel numbered 135,000. So the picture we have here is the enemies of God number 135,000, and the people of God number 32,000. So they're outnumbered about four to one. And then God says this, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remain. So now they've chiseled the army down to 10,000. Verse 4, but the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. I, I underline that in my notes again to remind me that at the moment there are still so many that Israel might be tempted to take credit for the victory that God has already told them that he would give. God continues, take them down to the water and I will thin them out for you there. I, I was at that spot just last year. It's a beautiful, beautiful sight uh, where God thinned out Israel's army from 10,000 down to 300. Uh, there, there's a little campground there now. We had a devotion right where they would have lapped this water and there were little kids uh, swimming in the water there. It was a, a pretty neat experience. God says, take them down to the water and I will thin them out with you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water in their tongues as a dog laps with those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others. So the picture here is, on one side of the camp, there's 135,000 enemies of God's people. On the other side of the camp, God's people start out with 32,000 men, about four to one odds. And God says, you have too many. Let's take them down. So then he trims it down to about 20,000. And then from 20,000, he says, well, there's still too many. You might be tempted to take credit for it. 
All of Israel and those that would witness the life of Israel need to understand that I am the one who gives the victory. So let's take it down to 300. Instead of four to one odds that they started with, now it's 400 to one odds. God says, now you've got your armies. This is a principle that was taught in the life of Gideon, and it's a principle that we see in the New Testament as well. I want to encourage you to turn over to the 2 Corinthians for a minute. I'm going to give you a moment to get there because these verses won't come on the screen. And that's intentional because I want you to really concentrate on these verses as a New Testament principle to understand that this was not just a principle that was taught in the life of Israel. This is a principle for the church as well. And that is that any time we want to move forward in our journey with Jesus it will be done best recognizing our own inadequacies, confessing before the Lord our need for Him because God's power is perfected in our weakness, just like it was in Gideon's and in Israel's. Listen to verses 1 through 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul was boasting in chapter 11 about some great things that God had been doing in his ministry. And in chapter 12, verse 1, he says, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. Verse 2, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Pause for a second, give you a little context. If you back up 14 years ago... Paul was left outside of the city of Lystra in Acts chapter 14 where they stoned him. They believed they stoned him to death. And they took him outside of the city and left him on the side of the road dead is what they believed. Paul says, I knew a man who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. We live in what would be referred to as the first heaven. The second heaven would be that uh, out there in the stratosphere which we can't see with our naked eye. The third heaven is that which is beyond the stratosphere, which is what we understand and refer to as heaven. That is where God dwells. Paul says, I knew 14 years ago a man who was caught up to heaven to be with God. Understanding that Paul is writing in a passage where he's been boasting on the Lord, it appears, and especially if you study Pauline literature, that he's referencing himself. He's speaking about a personal time where he was left outside a city, believed to be dead, that God took him in a vision to heaven and allowed him to see something. What did he see? Look in verse 3 as it continues. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. That's the third heaven. That's the place where God dwells. dwells. That's where Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And we know he went back to the Father. He says, this man heard inexpressible things that one is not permitted to tell. In other words, there's such, there's such greatness about heaven that we're only going to be able to understand a little bit of it this side of heaven. The Bible talks a little about heaven, but it doesn't give great detail about what life will be like. Why? Because the words in our vocabulary cannot fully describe what heaven will be like. You say, where did you get that? It says that Paul, or the man who was there, likely Paul, heard inexpressible things that he's not permitted to tell. Why? Because we can't handle how fully great heaven will be. It's so great. The Bible says it's out of this world. Verse 5, I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except, you catch this part, about my weaknesses. Verse 6, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so no one will think more of me than warranted by what I say or do, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. There he owns that the revelations were given to him. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Scholars have debated for years what this thorn in his flesh would be. Some say it was his failing eyesight, that he couldn't see real well. That's why if you go back and read some of Paul's letters, you see that he had someone that he would dictate to, and they would actually write them down. That wasn't because he thought he was too good to actually write. It was because he couldn't actually see very well. Some say it was an unbelieving wife. 
Now, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says that he was single, but many people believe because he was a member of the Sanhedrin that he had to have been married and that when he had such a radical conversion that his wife deserted him and he stayed single, whether you subscribe to that or not, what we do know is that Paul had a weakness. He had a challenge, so much so that he referred to it as a thorn in his flesh. In other words, his physical body. And he said he believed it to be a message from Satan. And he prayed to God specifically on three occasions, please take this away from me, whatever it was, whatever we believed it to be, he prayed, God, please take it away. Now look at how God answered him in verse 9. After he he said, three times I pleaded with the Lord, take it away. Verse 9, but he said, that's God, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. God's power is perfected in our weaknesses. In James 4, verse 6, it says, God opposes the proud. In verse 10, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. If we want God to lift us up, if we want God to use us in the way that he designed us to be used for his sake and for his glory, we must regularly come before him and acknowledge that any good that comes from us is because of him. It's not because of who we are. It's because of whose we are that God would choose to use fallible, fallen people with feet of clay like you and me. Hearing this, Paul says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Heard an illustration, and students, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to use the illustration that Todd used in the message Uh, on Thursday night when I was there to illustrate this point. Uh, Todd, before he was the executive pastor now at the Oklahoma Baptist Convention, he was the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist in Shawnee, Oklahoma, right by Oklahoma Baptist University. And he was a chaplain for the Oklahoma Baptist University football team. And he was talking about how coaches just live their life all the time. They live their work all the time. That when the season is over, they go straight out on the recruiting trail. And he said the coach pulled the coaches together and he was in the meeting after giving a little devotional. And the head coach said, coaches, I want to tell you who to look for when you're out on the recruiting trail. He said, you know when that guy just levels another player and then that player gets up. And one coach interrupted and said, you want us to go after that player that gets back up, don't you? He said, no, 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 that's not the player I'm talking about. He said, you know when the player levels that guy and he gets knocked down and then he gets back up and then he levels that guy again and a coach stopped and said, that's who you want us to go for. The one that gets knocked down and gets back up gets knocked down again and gets back up. And he said, no, no, hang on a second. He said, you know when the guy hits the guy and levels him, knocks him over. And then he gets back up and then he gets hit again and he gets knocked down. But then he gets back up and I said, then he hits him again and the guy gets knocked down and then he gets back up. And then finally a coach said, that's the one, the one that never quits, that gets knocked down, gets back up, gets knocked down, gets back up, gets knocked down again. And he gets back up and he said, absolutely not. I want you to get the guy that's knocking him down. You know, when I heard that story, man, I felt like knocking somebody down. And then I said, okay, you probably get hurt trying. Because I know my limitations today. He said, think about it. This is the picture the world looks for. I want the headhunter. I I, I want the one who's the strongest. I, I don't want the weakest. But that's not how God picks his team. God looks for the individuals that will stand before him and say, Lord... I am inadequate without you. God, I'm just a fumbling idiot next to you. And if I were to do anything great, it would only be because of what you do in me and what you would choose to do through me. May we become the people that would put ourselves before the Lord and say, whatever you can do with me, God, please do it. Hudson Taylor was known for this. 
Back in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, he started the China Inland Mission uh, in a mission field where people might go years without seeing a conversion. And in a number of years in his adult life, God used this man to see over 20,000 people surrender their life to the Lord Jesus Christ in communist China. One person asked him, how did you have such great impact? And he said, it seemed to me that God looked over the whole world to find a man who was weak enough to do his work. And when he had at last found me, he said, Hudson Taylor is weak enough. He'll do. And then he noted, all God's giants, when we look back through the scriptures, all of God's giants have been weak men and women who did great things for God because they counted on him being with them. Paul said, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may be perfected in me. God used Gideon because he was the least in his clan. God would use you and me as we would submit whatever we bring to the table and recognize that before God it's really nothing. And if we give him our nothing, he will use it for his sake and his glory and even for our good. Second thing we see in the passage is God's power is perfected in our obedience. God's power is perfected in our obedience. He uses both our weakness and our obedience to accomplish great things in and through our lives. Look at verses 9 through 22 as Gideon demonstrates this. Starting in verse 9. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. If you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such a force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, This can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into the hands Now listen at verse 15. Evidently Gideon needed this man to share this dream with him. Because in verse 15 we see his spine stiffen in the way it should. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. So I underline that in my Bible. I believe that's extremely significant in this passage. Because our obedience will only be at the level of our worship if our obedience really matters. Because living for Jesus is not about white-knuckling a walk that we can muster up in our own energies. No, it's about submitting to the Lord and allowing Him to live His life through us as we read in Galatians 2 and 20. And that will only be at the level in which we worship Him daily. It says of Gideon, he bowed down and he worshipped. Notice what happens immediately after his worship. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! (laughs) The Lord has given the Midianite camp into our hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, Then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp. At the beginning of the middle watch, that'd be about 10 p.m. at night, as they were just drifting off into a deep sleep. Just after they had changed the guard, they blew their trumpets and broke their jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets 
they were to blow, they shouted, A sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. So what we see here is we see a much inferior army, a little over 400 to 1 in number, with non-conventional weapons of war. Not only non-conventional in our warfare today, but non-conventional in their warfare. If you notice, they didn't even have a weapon. They had a jar with torches, and then they had horns. They had no weapons, but they surrounded the camp. And when they sounded the horns as the Midianites and those eastern people that fought with them, as they were deep in the sleep, these horns would have created a level of hysteria that would have swept throughout the camps. And then the sound of breaking jars, the glass breaking, would have sounded like an army invading them and destroying those that they could not see because of the bright light that from the fire torches also surrounded their camp. So in the midst of this chaos, rather than potentially being taken hostage and beaten to death severely, instead of being punished and beaten to death, they decided to take their own lives. And in chapter 8, verse 10, we see that 120,000 of the men actually committed suicide or homicide by killing those that they were with. I'll stab you if you stab me type of moment. 15,000 of them got away. But in chapter 8, we see God working through Ephraim, and some of the other Israelites to ensure that those 15,000 were done away with. How did he accomplish this? Because Gideon did what God said. Gideon obeyed God. And as Gideon obeyed God, God did the supernatural did what did not seem possible, and he used 300 men to overcome 120,000. And then in chapter 8, to overcome the last 15,000, completely doing away with the Midianites, just as God called obedience sometimes today, because of a misunderstanding of grace, can be seen as a bad word in the modern day church. Let's go back to the reformers just for a moment. Martin Luther wrote, there is no justification without sanctification. No forgiveness without renewal of life. There is no real faith from which the fruits of new obedience do not grow. A transformed life is not simply someone that just professes Christ. A transformed life is someone who possesses Christ. How do we know if we possess Christ? We look more like him as we grow. Heard a story of a man who had an estranged uncle, one that he had never met, and his son had never met his great uncle. He said, let's go to the city where my uncle lives after his father passed. I'd like to meet my uncle and learn more about my father, even from him. And the son said to the dad, I'd love to meet my great uncle too. Maybe I can get to know him even more since I only knew grandfather for a little while. And the son said to the father, how will we know when we see him? And the dad said, I'm not sure, but I think I'll recognize my uncle if we see him. And they went into this little town and they saw a man walking down the sidewalk. And the dad said, there is my uncle he said, how do you know that that is your father's brother? He said, I can tell by the way he walks. He walks just like his brother. Well, how can people tell that we love Jesus? By the way that we walk. We are to walk like Jesus. In Philippians 8, it says of Jesus in his earthly state that he was obedient even to death on a cross. The obedience that we see in Jesus' life is what he calls us to. 
And if we're really going to live an obedient life, we must get the first part of this passage right. It will come when we acknowledge our weaknesses. God, I can't on my own live like Jesus. I need your help. I need your help in my living and I need your help in my giving that I might look like Jesus. John Calvin writes, when God designs to forgive us, he changes our hearts and turns us to obedience by his spirit. Daily, we're to come before the Lord, confess our weaknesses to him, and ask that his spirit might demonstrate his power in a real and personal way so that we might live like Jesus In John 15, verses 9 and 11, Jesus promises to those who would live such obedient lives. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. Verse 10, if you keep my commands, that's obedience, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands. In other words, we live like him and remain in his love. Look at verse 11, John 15, 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. And that your joy may be complete. When we walk, acknowledging our weaknesses before the Lord, therefore we draw from his power and live like Jesus, it is then our joy is made complete. And we see this at the end of chapter 8 when all of the people of Midian had been subdued. In verse 28 it says, Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. Listen. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace for 40 years. If we want to experience the peace that God's people experience, we need to live as they did in this moment. And that was acknowledging before the Lord our weakness and walking in his power in obedience as he calls us to. How do we do that daily and practically? We can apart from this book. Uh, It was Sally in the Peanuts cartoon that I think that could remind us of that today. Remember the old Peanut comic strip? Sally was memorizing a verse for Sunday school and she couldn't remember where the verse was. And somebody said, come on, Sally, you, you can remember. She said, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I think it was in the last book of the Bible. You know, the book of reevaluations. <laughs> well, it wasn't the book of reevaluations, but man, shouldn't we take this book out daily and reevaluate our own life? Reevaluate it against God's word, and it won't take long as we look at God's word and look at our life to say, Help me, Lord. I need your strength because your power is made perfect in my weakness. And when I acknowledge this, then I can live out your power perfectly through obedience. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the book of reevaluations. As we look at examples before us like Gideon, may we reevaluate our own life and understand that we need you. And as we acknowledge this need to you, may you fill us with your power. May it be perfect, perfected in our weakness in such a way that we would live an obedient life, one for your sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So our song of invitation I learned this morning was written at Falls Creek, and it was written for Falls Creek. Wherever he lead us, we would go. That's the type of life that God calls for us to live. So I want to encourage you, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, maybe you would come and see one of our pastors today. If you've been walking with Jesus for a short or a long season, but you recognize that you've been walking in your own strength and not his power and you just like somebody to pray over you. Some of our prayer partners will be out at the wings in just a moment. Feel free to come and pray with them. If you have questions about what it means to be a part of this local fellowship, we'd love to answer them for you, but we can unless you let us know. Just come see one of us if you'd like. If not, you just stand and you sing and you pray to the Lord that wherever he leads, we, we would follow. Stand if you would. Let's sing and if you need to come, you come.